I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dyke has retired. This chapter of the Silent Service deals with one of the most daring exploits of the United Nations forces in the Korean War. It concerns not only a submarine and its crew, but some passengers that were rough, tough, and, well, I'll let you be the judge. The United States Navy submarine Perch was a typical fleet submarine. Its rebirth began at the Mare Island Naval Shipyard in California, where certain modifications changed it into a special breed of ship. Hey, what are they doing on the Perch? Beats me. Mr. Saunders? Murphy? Cox? Just get back from leave? Yes, sir. Oh. What's going on, sir? Minor overhauling. They took out two of her main engines. Well, with two of her engines gone, everybody will beat us back to port. Torpedo tubes have been removed, too. Well, without torpedoes, what good is she? They're making a troop carrier out of her. A what? Room for 110 troops and equipment. Well, it's a raw deal, Mr. Saunders. They can't do that to the best sub in a the fleet. They've already done it, Murphy. Not much we can do about it. Well, maybe you can't, sir. But I can ask to transfer to a fighting ship. I didn't volunteer for submarine service to ride herd on a water taxi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what do we do in case of war? We shuttle a bunch of VIPs around? Well, there are other possible uses for a troop carrier in combat. For example, the landing of commandos behind enemy lines. Is that straight, sir? If it isn't, I'll ask for a transfer myself. Hey. After her conversion to an underwater transport, the Perch was placed in a one-year evaluation status. Under the command of Lieutenant Commander Robert D. Quinn, landing exercises were held in the San Diego area. A specially picked company of the 1st Marine Division became very proficient in embarking and debarking under simulated combat conditions. The numerous drills and dives soon convinced the crew that the Perch was no left-handed, dangerous freak, but had a definite role to play in any future warfare. The Korean War broke out during the final stages of her evaluation. The Perch and her crew were ready. She was ordered to Japan. The word was that she would transport marine raiders into enemy waters. Excitement ran high as the crew anticipated the missions ahead. They were determined to prove the Perch's efficiency. Skipper Quinn, Exec Flessner, and Bill Saunders engaged in thinking sessions. Was the Perch really ready for combat? Could our performance be improved? We've got to anticipate every emergency, whether it arises or not. What do you think will give us the most trouble, Captain? Shore batteries? Bill, I'm concerned about everything the enemy can throw at us. Shore batteries, patrol boats, planes, destroyers, subs, well, you name it. They probably have it. Say nothing of rocks and shoals. Well, we can't stand too far offshore, sir. The landing party has to paddle those rubber boats. Exactly. Right now, we can't estimate how close to the target area we dare go. In some cases, it can be pretty bad. Yeah, I'm afraid so. That's what worries me. Those Marines would be sitting ducks during such a long trip to shore. To say nothing of uh, being pretty tired by the time they hit the beach. Now, they definitely require better and faster transportation than those rubber boats. Now, they need something to tow them and drop them off closer in. A whaleboat would be too big. But a small skimmer. A rubber boat with a with a with an outboard. Yeah, that would do the job. That sounds like the answer, Captain. I'll bet it'll work. Well, what about the sound of the skimmer's engine? Wouldn't that alert the enemy? Well, not if we muffled the engine. Yeah. The only problem I see is where to stow it. No strain. We stow it with the other rubber boats. How about installing an antenna that can race above the surface? We'll need it for ship to shore communication. Yeah, that's a good idea. When we get to Japan, I'll ask the division commander for approval. Now, here's what I was thinking. Yokosuka Naval Base near Tokyo, August 1950. Skipper Quinn received permission to install a new radio antenna. The skimmer was housed in the hangar in place of the LVT. Cox, Murphy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How would you men like to live dangerously? Well, what have you got in mind, sir? A transfer to the Marines? <laughs> well, almost. I've been put in charge of the skimmer. I need a good coxswain and a machinist mate. All we have to do is tow the assault craft ashore, land explosives, pick up casualties. Might be fun. 
This is strictly on a volunteer basis. Well, you can count me in, sir. How about you, Joe? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's always been against my principles to volunteer for anything. Uh, couldn't you just order me to do it, sir? I could. Aye, aye, sir. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Quinn trained his men in the tricky job of launching the skimmer. Time for either operation was cut down to two minutes flat. Perch was now ready to take Marines for a raid behind enemy lines in North Korea. But the Marines had already been flown to Korea and were in the thick of the fighting. The men of the Perch shrugged off their disappointment and plunged into the work of training first underwater demolition teams, then Army Special Activities troops for that big mission. But somehow the orders never came. It seemed that the eager crew of the Perch was destined to be always a bridesmaid but never a bride. Morale was at its lowest ebb. I tell you, it's a plot. Someone's deliberately keeping us out of combat. Maybe they're saving us for bigger things, like a USO tour. Oh, let's face it, fellas. We're stuck in a training ship for the rest of the war. Well, I should have transferred when I had the chance. Ah, the other subs ain't seen any more action than us. All right, but I could have been on a flat top or a tin can. They ain't sitting out for war. I knew it. Take the insides out and all you got left's a shell. <laughs> They ought to rename this bucket the shellfish. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, all the outfits we trained are over there fighting the war. Yeah, for all the good we're doing, we could have stayed in San Diego. Oh, come on, Joe. Maybe we can stir up some action at the Saddle Club. All righty. See you, Spike. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Echo. I didn't see you. Well, why don't you look where you're gone? What do you think you're still back in the London fog? Listen, you stepped right into my blooming way. What are you talking about? I stepped into your way. You fucked yeah, me, hey. you... Hey! right to stop me. Could have taken him easy. Oh, come on, Murph. You just jumpy, that's all. He couldn't help it. Take a boat. Let's make a bed, Jack. This will do you for the one I spill. Thanks. Ogilvy's my name. Stan Ogilvy. This is Harry Craig. Craig? Murphy's the name. Phil Murphy. Cut. Hi. Have a seat. All right. Murphy, eh? Well, that accounts for the quick temper, anyway. <laughs> Look, our nations are allies. Why shouldn't we be? Why fight amongst ourselves? We've got so much of it to do in Korea. I'll drink to that. All right. We've only got here two days ago. What's those ruddy fish for? Twin dolphins. Meaning what? Submarine service. What I'd fit you with? Royal Marines. 41st Independent Commandos. You blokes have been in the thick of it, haven't you? How many ships you sell? Well, uh, uh, four transports and an aircraft carrier. What do you know? It's not bad going. The scene is how the North Koreans got no aircraft carriers. <laughs> well, it was one of our own. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see you got the wit of the Irish to go with this plea. Where in Ireland were you born, Murphy? Dublin, South Dublin. Really, no. My own father spent time in the city to your birth, then. He was with the army during the revolution. With the black and tans? Well, of course. Don't tell me your father was in the rebel army. Well, sure he was. <laughs> Remarkable coincidence. You know, your father and mine might have traded bullets on some dark Dublin street 30 years ago. It's amazing. It's a small world. Yeah, next time I write the governor, I'll have to tell him about this. He won't believe it. <laughs> <coughs> what ship are you on? Uh, the Perch. Oh, we've heard of her. That's the one without the torpedoes, isn't it? Hey, that's classified information. Murphy, how'd you sink them four transports? With a pea shooter. Oh, <laughs> Murphy, Murphy, I've got a sneaking suspicion you're nothing but a blowhard. Whale of a boaster. But when it comes... You want to step in the alley? <laughs> a submarine without torpedoes. It's like going to war without a gun. <laughs> Come on, Joe. This guy don't want to fight. He just wants to talk us to death. <laughs> See you later. Right, sir. <laughs> Bye. Hey! Hey, Murph! Look at those uniforms. Another outfit to train. Uh... Hi, you chaps. I hear you run a ruddy rough training outfit. Did you know last night you were assigned to the perch? Of course, old man. Well, cheerio, chaps. We must have tea together. Wise guy. <laughs> what are you laughing at? 
41st Royal Commando Unit attacked their training exercises with such vigor that the entire crew of the Perch, including Murphy, was impressed. In that one intensive week, the commandos became a fast-moving, hard-hitting, well-coordinated submarine raiding team. Their appetites were enormous. The ship's cook figured they averaged six eggs a man at breakfast. September 25th, 1950. Orders from headquarters, United Nations Command. Land raiding party in North Korea. The waiting and the training were over. An innovation in modern warfare was about to be tested. We're approaching target area. Very well, all ahead, one third. All ahead, one third. The commandos were briefed on their objective. That's pretty stuffy down there with all those passengers. Oxygen content low. Come in snorkeling on one engine, it'll freshen things up. Bye, sir. See any lights? Not a thing, Captain. Right, I'm gonna surface in about an hour, I'll take over. Aye, aye, sir. Nineteen hundred. Tenseness gripped every man, commando and sailor alike. The perch slid quietly to a point offshore. The sea was calm. Now let's go. Have troop and boat details take their station. Troop and boat details take their station. Surface. on shore, they're going out. Must be a trap. Probably picked us up on radar. Recover the skimmer! Recover the proper boat! Control? There's a plane overhead. Check IFF. See if it's ours. Bear a hand on deck! Thanks for that moon to come out. Bridge, don't stick on all IFF. Oh, must be a MiG.
Birch and the commandos had almost fallen into a trap on their first target. They had a secondary target, an ammunition dump 10 miles to the north. Major Collins, the Marine commander, was ready to go ahead, but Skipper Quinn was undecided. Major, the whole coast might be alerted to us by now. Now, let's check with the task group commander and see what diversionary action we can scare up. Now, here are two possibilities. A destroyer could shell target one. And meanwhile, the Air Force could stage a nuisance raid here to the north. That would confuse them completely. I think you can brief your men on target too, Major. Might as well make this trip necessary, huh? Say, Stan, is it true about that rum business? It's an old British custom. Every sailor or Marine gets a drink of rum daily. Or threepence instead. Threepence? How much is that in America money? Oh, by about six cents, I think. They can keep the money. They can keep the whole blinking Navy and the submarines. For a man to do a good job of fighting, he needs God's green earth under him and fresh air to breathe. Well, that depends on how you look at it. You know, that was a close call tonight. You guys would have been clobbered if we'd have taken you in. There'll be proper fireworks when we blow up that ammo dump tomorrow night. Ain't you scared of nothing? Not for you to see, anyway. After all, I am an Englishman. Yeah, you gotta live up to that stiff upper lip routine, huh? Hey, I got news for you. I wasn't born in Ireland. Neither was my old man. I just happened to see some movies of the Irish Revolution. You don't surprise me. It was a gag. That's what I like about all you Yanks. You're all a lot of jokers. The following morning, the Perch made rendezvous with the destroyer Maddox. A discussion of events with the task group commander resulted in agreement that diversionary attacks be made in conjunction with the commando raid on Target 2. October 1st, at 7 in the evening, the diversionary attacks had commenced. Would they work? The radar man reported the two patrol boats in front of the target area had both moved off. One to the south, the other to the north. The target area was clear. Bunch of guys. Stand by to go in in case they need us. Aye, sir. guards around. Well, getting to that ammo dump won't be too tough. Getting back's gonna be murder. Boy, they can have it. That's what Oglesby said about the submarines. <laughs>
quiet. That's the way the commandos like it. Without surprise, they're dead. I didn't see them load any explosives in the skimmer. Well, they're using phosphorus grenades. Throw a few of those into an ammo dump and you've had it. I sure hope we don't have to leave those boys. Uh, it'll have to be awfully hot before we do. a long time. They're in no hurry. When they get back to the beach, where do we go in so they don't have to paddle out so far? If it's safe, they'll let us know. Yeah, that commie up on top of that rock with a machine gun could get every one of them. Cops, I'm beginning to think you're a pessimist. Yes, sir. I was born that way. Radio sounds? Just a minute. No, not yet. Oh, this is murder. Standing off like this, not being able to help. Looks like the mission's accomplished. At what cost? Skimmer to shore, repeat message. Right, coming in. We're going in, Murphy, a casualty. He's up, man, Murphy. Ten to the duck. Don't you want us to throw you in at the same time? No, nah, the Major said we make out okay. Get going, he needs help. Good show, Yank. Good show. Don't you worry about it, Sarge. We'll get you there in a few minutes. The skimmer hurried back toward the beach and took the boats in tow. Looks like we've made it. Control, Major Collins will want to know how a sergeant is. Check on it for me. Oh. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, thanks. Sergeant Stanley Oglesby, Royal Marines, 41st Independent Commandos, was buried at sea the following morning. The experience from constant training and the careful planning by the Marines and the Purchase crew had much to do with the raid's success. This was only the beginning for the Perch. It had fulfilled its destiny. I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. I'd like you to meet the executive officer of the USS Perch on the raid you have just seen dramatized, Commander Conrad J. Flessner. You had a rough time getting a chance to put that landing party ashore. Yes, it looked for a while like we'd done a lot of training for nothing. Those Royal Marines evidently were a pretty tough bunch of commandos. I couldn't begin to express my admiration for them. They did the job they were sent to do and lost only one man. It sounds like a real workmanlike performance. It was. They were well trained and they had plenty of what it takes. I'd say the same applies to the ship's company of the Perch. Congratulations to every one of you. Join us again for another true and exciting story of the silent service. Take your long and walk the line Through the deep blue underneath the ocean We'll control the ocean line Underneath the 
Yeah. 